Big changes are coming for New York City because of new green legislation. If you're a New York City building owner, this new legislation can have a sizable impact on your future. But understanding exactly what that impact is can be confusing. There's a lot of information out there right now. It's hard to digest everything. That's why we here at JBNB have made this, the first of a series of videos that's aimed specifically at letting you know what the changes are, how they're gonna impact you as a building owner, and what you can do in the future to get ahead of the curve. Hi, I'm Molly D, and I'm the head of our Deep Carbon Reductions group here at JBNB. As somebody who's actively involved in the construction and real estate industry, I and everybody here at the firm has a vested interest in any and all legislation pertaining to the New York City built environment. There's been a lot that's been happening in these last six months, but I'm here today to tell you about a particularly impactful piece of legislation that just passed the City Council back in April. Let's talk Local Law 97 of 2019, or Local Law 97 for short. Local Law 97 is a new law that was passed on April 18th as part of New York City's Climate Mobilization Act, along with a plethora of other introductions and resolutions aimed at addressing climate change. Local Law 97 places a hard cap on carbon emissions for most existing buildings over 25,000 square feet. Now I say most and not all because there are some exceptions, but they're far and few between. We'll get into the details of the law later on in a different video, so stay tuned for that. Whether you're personally passionate about addressing climate change or you're just interested in being in compliance with these new laws, it's important to realize that Local Law 97 places serious responsibility on not just the shoulders of New York City's building owners, but also on tenants and all of those people who participate in the New York City built environment. So this new law goes into effect in 2024, which is right around the corner. And the law discusses three distinct stages of implementation. The first from 2024 to 2029, then from 2030 to 2034, and finally from 2035 and beyond. And what's important to note is that as you go from stage to stage, the allowable carbon emissions limits actually decrease, which means that your responsibility as a building owner increases in kind. So the good news is that the first stage of implementation, this period from 2024 to 2029, is really aimed at the worst 20% of buildings in New York City. That means that most people aren't necessarily gonna be impacted right away in that first stage. When we talk about the 2030 to 2034 stage, however, that's where a lot of people are gonna find that they're impacted by the law. So let's get to the meat and potatoes of the issue here. What happens if you're not in compliance with the new law? And the short answer is, non-compliance is tied to potentially harsh financial penalties that get worse over time. So let me give you an example to put this in perspective. A 1 million square foot commercial office building just 10% above the 2024 limit would be looking at a penalty of around $230,000 a year. And remember, that's every year between 2024 and 2029. So it's also worth noting that those hard carbon emissions limits are gonna get more stringent over time. So if we return to our previous example, that 1 million square foot commercial office building can expect to see a 50% reduction in allowable limits as we go from 2029 to 2030. This equates to a $1.2 million penalty every year between 2030 and 2034. Thankfully, the law does allow for some relief from the penalties through alternate compliance paths, and those would include things like renewable energy credits, also known as RECs, or greenhouse gas offsets. Now, there are limits and caveats even associated with those alternate compliance paths, but it's certainly one piece of the puzzle to keep in mind. At this point, you might be thinking to yourself, how can New York City possibly do this? It's so aggressive. But there's actually quite a bit of history and context associated with this law and other laws like it. Internationally, the conversation about carbon has been ongoing for nearly 30 years under the guidance of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Since its inception, the UNFCC has been working with countries all over the world on carbon emissions mitigation, adaptation, and finance policy. In 2016, the United States took a major step along with numerous other parties to the UNFCC in the signing and ratification of the Paris Climate Agreement. That's great, but what does that have to do with New York City? First with Mayor Bloomberg, now with Mayor de Blasio, New York City has essentially aligned itself with the goals of the 2016 Paris Climate Agreement. This translates to a commitment citywide to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 80% by the year 2050. So to put it lightly, that's a lofty goal. And while New York City has certainly stepped up with things like various sustainability initiatives, the New York City Energy Conservation Code, smattering of local laws specifically aimed at energy use, the latest projections show that we're just not on track to meet that 80% reduction by 2050 goal. 
What's the takeaway? The takeaway is that because of New York City's unwavering commitment to these ideas of the Paris Climate Agreement, the city is just primed for more aggressive sustainability and energy legislation. It also indicates that Local Law 97 is probably just the first of many more pieces of legislation that are focusing on these issues. In fact, we're already starting to see more. New York State just raised the ante with its new Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. That's got to be a video all its own. Now you know what Local Law 97 is, the important takeaways, and the context in which the law was created. But if you're like most people, you probably still have a million questions. Things like, what does this really mean for the New York City real estate and construction industry? Or how is this going to impact the New York City economy? What about the grid? What about things like tenant energy use or occupant density? More than anything, the question is, is it even possible to do what's needed to be in compliance with the new law? These are all great questions, and we're going to be exploring each of these topics and many more in future videos. So stay tuned, and thanks for watching.